Garden of Eden, Tree of Life, we call it home. Talking the Orinoco flow and the source of the Amazon River, the mighty tree stump. We're just talking Roraima. Take off, man. Oh, 
buy it for about these jungles and this botany, the plant life, and I wanted to give you a visual. You might not have a visual of everything these explorers are seeing in these books. I mean, these people are going up there, you know, for a few days or so, but these explorers in the 1800s, man, they really got it in. They really saw some things. You, know? you can't really see what they saw in a little trip like this. But if you really went in for the for the real thing, you might see the cities of gold. Oh, 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 oh. Cities of gold. <clears throat> Let go. We're gonna get the rest of this for the dismount, man. Let's get into it. talking about the tree of life the mighty tree stump right the beautiful the beautiful Mount Royal Rain you see how this is a cut off tree I mean don't take it from me let's get it love to Joseph the real for some great Rorema drop let's get it AncientOrigins.net Islands in the cloud, man. The floating clouds of Avatar or Awatar. Island in the clouds is Mount Rorema really a lost world where dinosaurs may still exist? Well, you know, we're talking dragons, not dinos. No such thing as a dinosaur. All of them are dragons, whether they have wings or not. Deep within the rainforest of Venezuela, a series of plateaus arise more than 9,000 feet. More than 9,000 feet. Off the ground from above, they look like islands in the sky. These are the Tepuis, a Piman word, Piman Indian word for mountain. The most famous of which is called Mount Rorema. Well, these Tepuis, you know, they're called flat top mountains or tabletop mountains. The Tepuis are so unique in their geography that thousands of plant species exist nowhere else on the plain <laughs> except on these plateaus. The mystical mountains, the mystical mountains. We've been reading about how the flora lights up at night just like Avatar. Everything lights up and starts to glow like fluorescence that these people are seeing in these books. These explorers, you don't got no explorers no more. But back then you had these books like the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle book we've been reading called The Lost World. And we'll get back in that today. We'll also get into the devil tree of El Dorado. A hop to tie battle for all the great research as well on this Rorema. As well as Chef Candy. She's been digging on it and reading it every Sunday 
At six o'clock, she's been reading the devil tree of El Dorado. Man. Wow. So the teamwork is making this dream work for us. The mystical mountains fascinated explorers and writers for centuries, most notably Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who describes an ascent or an ascent of Mount Morema in his 12 or 1912 novel, The Lost World. So just like you just saw these people going up making a sense, I wanted to give you the visual. Because we're about to go in on the 1912 expeditions and before. In Doyle's novel, a group of explorers found that dinosaurs and other extinct creatures were still alive. So your dragons are still alive. Still alive and well on the remote plateau. They just got to the high places, right? Some people today still believe this to be a real possibility. Hmm. The real lost world. Once impenetrable to all the Piedmont indigenous people, so they couldn't get in there, right? These Piedmonts, because they're not the OG or original Amaru Khan. They didn't know the way. They were afraid of the mountain. They call it the devil tree, the demon mountain, because they were afraid of your dragons that were not their dragons. Mount Orema really was a lost world. The mountain plateaus were already established when South America was linked with Africa to form the supercontinent Gondwana, meaning that they were first formed. Dodge the chronological hijack. 400 million years ago Well, we know that they are only saying that this this goes back to creation itself During this time molten rock forced its way up the cracks in the sandstone landmass At the same time wind and water swept across Gondwana to erode the road the raised highlands into mountain ranges or They were trees. Let's go you don't have to explain all this with 400 million years of erosion and all this science jargon. The creator created trees, man. The region would come to look much like it does now around 20 million years ago. All right, let's get it. Because the Tepuis have been isolated for so long atop their high, lonely plateaus, the flora and fauna of the Tepuis provide an organic illustration of the process of evolution. It is guessed that at least half of the estimated 10,000 plant species here are unique to Tepuis and surrounding lowlands. So again, there's a complete, entirely different ecosystem at this ether. This is a different etheric field than what we're on right now. And plants exist up there that can't exi exist down here. The mango tree doesn't grow, you know, past... I believe it's 1,500 uh, you know, feet above sea, sea level, something like that, at least 1,500. So uh, definitely not at 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 feet. So certain crops grow at certain heights or ether. Now you're talking about 9,000 feet. You got a whole nother ecosystem. Although all the Tepuis have been climbed, only a few have been extensively explored. So they climb them all the time. We just showed them climbing them. But only a few have been extensively explored. Could this mean that supposedly extinct species, even dragons, even dinos, may still exist atop these remote plateaus? Are they still guarding the garden? Are they still guarding Eden? Remember, we're just talking about the Orinoco flow. How this mountain is the source of the Orinoco River. We got how Columbus said that the Orinoco River must be flowing out of the terrestrial paradise. And if it's flowing out of Mount Verena, then by default, he's calling this the terrestrial paradise. The source of the Orinoco flow, Amazon. Let's go. 
Could the legend be real? The Mount Roraima plateaus are so remote and so unique that it is not difficult to imagine Sir Arthur Conan Doyle creating a world alive with prehistoric plants and dinos, dragons, and in his novel, The Lost World, Doyle was fascinated with the account of British botanist Ever, Everwhere, or Ever, Eam Thurn, um, who climbed to the top of Mount Roraima in December 1884. So again, 1800s they were exploring now you don't hear about it at all why you don't hear about antarctica explorations no more like admiral bird that's been shushed shut down you don't hear about exploring within the walls within the ice walls that you don't hear about these lost worlds no more 1884 Botanist Everard Eam Thurn climbed to the top of Mount Roraima, December 1884, ascending Mount Roraima in 1989 for the G, for the National Geographic Society. German explorer Uwe George said, "None of us who followed Eam Thurn to Roraima have found primordial creatures or their fossil remains there, but the terrain is so difficult." that only a fraction of the Tapui's 44 square miles has so far been explored. Why do you think the terrain is so difficult? Because it's a barrier. They're not going to make it easy for you. You don't just get to climb up and see all the drop. You're going to have to get through that terrain or you're going to have to know your way to the drop. You don't just get to take a helicopter ride and say, ooh, look, the city's a go." It's not about what's on the mountain. It's not about what's on the tree. It's about what's in it. This is a fortress, a fortified barrier protecting something very, very, very important. Sacred ground. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, the natives of Venezuela viewed the Tepuis as having special mythical significance according to the Piedmont Indians. Mount Roraima is what? The stump of a mighty tree. Drop's not the one telling you about Mount Roraima being a tree. The Piedmont Indians even are holding the indigenous root that this is rooted this is a tree that's rooted these are roots underneath this tree and this tree once touched the firmament and it was cut down it was cut down cut down by who let's keep reading so according to the Piedmont Indians the Mount Warrema is the stump of a mighty tree that once held all the fruits and tuberous vegetables in the world. Tree of life. It's the source of the Amazon. Orinoco that Columbus said is flowing out of terrestrial paradise. Christopher Columbus was keen, keenly interested, keenly interested in finding the lost Garden of Eden. One of his prized possessions was a copy of Cardinal Pierre de Alli's Imago Mundi, a geographical treatise that suggested 
terrestrial paradise perhaps is the place which the authors call the fortunate islands columbus's copious marginal notes demonstrate his abiding interest in mapping the location of the lost garden when he stumbled onto the island of hispaniola columbus believed he was close to rediscovering eden a belief reinforced by the strength of the Orinoco River. I have never read or heard of so great quantity of fresh water coming into and near the salt, he wrote to Spain's King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, quote, and the very mild climate also supports this view, and if it does not come from there, from paradise, if the Orinoco isn't coming from paradise, Orinoco, paradise it seems to be a greater marvel for i do not believe that there is known in the world a river so great and so deep columbus belief that he was near the earthly paradise is evident in his first letter to the spanish monarchs he notes the paradisical beauty of the islands we're talking paradise the mildness of the climate and abundance of food, the innocent charm of the natives, the Nagas, and the richness of the island's natural resources in language, suggesting that he believed himself close to believed himself close to the lost earthly paradise. We're just talking about the lost world. Just talking about the lost world. Mount Warema in Venezuela is not a tall mountain to climb, but it's very difficult to reach. It is located in one of the most isolated places in South America in Kanama National Park. Kanama, Kanama is a park the size of Belgium yet accessible by only one road. <laughs> We're just talking about the lost world, man. Go ahead and click these links. You got them all below. And again, they're going back into this author Conan Doyle, The Lost World, right? The Lost World. So let's go. Just talking the Orinoco flow. And you can't talk Orinoco without talking paradise, according to Columbus. You can't talk Orinoco without talking Mount Warrena, the source. Remember this link in Britannica.com. Mount Warrema. What does it say? Nine miles long, nine thousand feet high. It is the source of many rivers, the Guyana and of the Amazon and the Orinoco river system and Columbus knows that the a belief reinforced re, rediscovering Eden Eden a belief reinforced by the strength of the Orinoco River so the Orinoco has everything everything to do with paradise. Orinoco has everything to do with paradise. If it does not come from there from paradise, it seems still a greater marvel still. For I 
Do not believe there is known in the world a river so great and so deep as the what? Orinoco, as the what? Orinoco, flowing out of Roraima, along with the Amazon. Let's go. Mount Warrema is the stump of a mighty tree. You know, it's interesting when you know they flipped your map over. You think the North Pole is above you when it's beneath you. And X marks the spot. Once held all the fruits and tuberous vegetables in the world. Astonishing rocks with shapes and profiles that resemble gargoyles, Indian deities, Cambodian temples. So rocks are resembling temples and deities, Indian deities, gargoyles, or dragons. <laughs> Welcome to the lost world. Let's get another great drop right here by uh, Yosef the Real. We're just talking with Rayma. I think it's a great time to focus in on such a wonderful place, a brilliant place, a place that's been explored and called the lost world and have all these theories about these dragons that still live there we read about you know Preston John the legend and the sources in these areas these caverns of dragons that are protecting these cities and one thing seems to be connecting with the other when you know that Solomon King David rocked very very much so <laughs> in South America, Venezuela, all these areas. You know that they're hot spots when you talk about King Solomon and the gold and Sheba and Khalifa. This is a very important area. One of the oldest formations on earth, man. We just talk with creation, right? Now this one says uh, Mount Warrema is the highest mountain of the Pacarema chain of Tipui plateaus in South America or the floating islands. Also known as Tipui, Warrema and Sierra Warrema. It serves as the triple border between or point of Venezuela, Guyana and Brazil. Bounded on all sides by cliffs raising 400 meters the mountain was first described by English explorer Sir Walter Raleigh during his expedition in 1595. So, so far we talked about expeditions in the 1900s, 1800s, and now you have an expedition in the 1500s by Sir Walter Raleigh. But you don't want to talk about it. It's not even in your mind, right? It lies on the Guyana Shield in the, in the southeastern corner of Venezuela's 30,000 square foot Kanama National Park, which remember is the size of Belgium. You got this you know, link, you can enjoy these pictures, see what you can you know, materialize with your eyes when you see these so-called rock formations. Now, let's get this part right here. It says the natives of the Grand Sabana, which sounds so much like San Banyan, the Piedmont and the Capone, see Rorema as the stump of a mighty tree that in the past held all the fruits and tuberous vegetables in the world. They believe that the tree was cut down 
by Maku Naima, their mythical trickster, and crashed to the ground, unleashing a terrible flood. Ain't that what we've been saying? Ain't that what the scripture says, that the trees will be cut down? And we say, well, who cut the tree down? They believe that the tree was cut down by Maku Naima. Now, they call Maku Naima a mythical trickster. Let's hit up uh, Job 14. Let's see what we got here. Let go. Verse 7, for there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. Hmm. So when you look at these trees and you imagine them being cut down like we're just hearing about this Maku Naima This is a beautiful scripture too. Let's get this uh, Ezekiel. You surfing the wave on these scripts, man. I mean, it's pretty much all here for us. Again, right here though. If it be cut down, Job 14, 7. That it will sprout again. So when we're looking at pictures of our mountains, of our trees, and they're saying that this is a tree that's been cut down, this tree will sprout again, our people. The tree of life will sprout again. And that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root there, thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet the scent of water, water, through the scent of water, it will bud 
and bring forth bows like a plant. I'm going to read this part right here in Ezekiel 31. Ezekiel 31, verse 5, Therefore its height was exalted above all the trees of the field. Its bows were multiplied. And its branches became long because of the abundance of water. What did you say in uh, Job? Chapter 14, verse 9. Yet yeah, through the scent of water, it will bud. Through the scent of water, it will bud. Ezekiel. Therefore its height was exalted above all the trees of the field. Its bows were multiplied. And its branches became long because of the abundance of water as it sent them out. All the birds of the heavens made their nest in its bows under its branches. Under its branches. Wow. See if I can get this thing going. I'm trying to jam up my net net. Now we're going to get into this devil tree of El Dorado. <laughs> Love to tie battle. And this part right here, man, you know, we're going to get there. But when we talk about these Hebrews. And these priests that they're finding on the tree, in the tree, during this excavation, right? During this invasion. They call them the religion of the white priest or brotherhood. They're not talking about white people. <laughs> Just like Aztec, Aslan is the place of whiteness. They're talking about the purity, the pure priest or brotherhood resembles in many respects that of the Hebrews. Save that for God, they use the term great spirit or good or almighty spirit. So some people they're meeting is resembling who? Hebrew. Now when we talk this mighty tree and again, Ezekiel, what's this, uh, 31? You know, take it to, uh, actually, let me pull it up. Let me pull it up right here. I think we're good again. I think we're back good. Dodging these hijacks. Dodging the drop, dodging the raindrops. So we don't get wet. Let's go to Ezekiel 31. Here we go. We back. So verse 4 says, The waters made him great. Let's go to 3. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches. They're describing this Assyrian as being like this cedar before it gets cut down, right? Beautiful cedars that got cut down. 
with a shadowing shroud and of high stature and his top was among the thick bones. The waters made him great, the deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants and set out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. The rivers are coming out, what, like the Amazon, like the Orinoco. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field. And his bows were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nest in his bows, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, all the beasts like who? The dragons. And under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Remember, every tribe had a tree. Thus he was fair in his greatness, in his length of his branches, for his root was by great waters, great waters, great waters. When he stumbled onto the island of Hispaniola, Columbus believes he was close to rediscovering Eden, a belief reinforced by the strength, by the great, by the great waters, by the strength of the Orinoco River. I do not believe that there is known in the world a river so great and so deep. Great and so deep. We're talking great waters. Thus was he fair in his greatness in the length of his branches for his root was by great waters the cedars in the garden of Hawa could not hide him the fir trees were not like his bows and the chestnut trees were not like his branches nor any tree in the garden of Hawa was unlike unto him in all his beauty I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden, all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of Hawa envied him. We're just talking about the garden of Eden, the lost garden of Eden, and this tree that they're calling a mighty tree stump. The Piedmont Indians call it the mighty tree stump, the strength of the Orinoco, the source of the Amazon River. And there's no tree like it in Eden. The garden of Hawa was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair in the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of Hawa envied him. Therefore says Hawa because thou hast lifted thyself in height and hast shot up his top among the thick bows and his heart is lifted up in his height I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen the mighty one like a mighty trickster They believed that the tree was cut down by Maku Naima, their mythical trickster, and crashed to the ground. Did Hawa send Maku Naima to cut down the mighty tree? We knew it was cut down by angels, right? We knew it was cut down by mighty angels or mighty dragons, right? I have therefore delivered him into the hands of the mighty one of the heat, and he shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out of, out for his wickedness and strangers 
the terrible of the nations have cut him off and left him upon the mountains and in all the valleys his branches are fallen and his bows are broken by all the rivers of the land and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. To the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height. All that drink water for all for are all delivered unto death to the neither parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. So not only were you cut off, your trees were cut down when the Naga was cut down. Cut down by who? They believe that the tree was cut down by Maku Naima, their mythical trickster, and crashed to the ground, unleashing a terrible flood. Mighty flood, huh? What's this flood got to do with you? What's this flood got to do with Noah? What's this flood got to do with Atlantis? Huh? What's it got to do with the Naga? What's it got to do with Makunima? Now, this link right here, nativelanguages.org, legendary native, all right? American figures, Maku Naima or Maku Naima, right. tribal affiliation, Akawao Pima. So, according to these Pima Indians, who again they call it a mighty tree stuff, they also don't really got a lot of drop on it. So, they're looking at it from the outside, looking in. Carib, all right, alternate spellings, here you go. Now, they say the type is a creator, culture hero, a high guy. So, whoever this represents, whether it represented the creator to these particular tribes, or whether it represented a high level angelic power, Makunaima is the name of a great creator god of the Akoaio and neighboring. Kareban tribes. The name Makunaima literally means he works by night. Traditional Kareban cosmology has become very muddled since the arrival of Christian missionaries. Hijack 101. Though older myths featuring Makunaima as a legendary culture hero who slays monsters. He slays monsters, so he slays trees and monsters. Who they call him monsters? Dragons, so he's a dragon slayer. Okay. In more recent texts, these exploits are usually ascribed to Sigu instead. In more, what's it say? In more recent texts, so we know it's been hijacked. While Mako, Mako Nima is translated as God. So this is in more recent texts. They're now translating Mako Nima as God or great spirit. But originally, he's a legendary character or hero who slays the dragon, right? Slays the monster. Mako Naima is often said never to have been seen by a mortal man. Mako Naima. Alright. Here's another link. On the legend of Maku Naima. And we got a piece of this before. We'll get a small piece right here. The creation myth describes how the first Pima, the sun, right, the sun found a wife after meeting a water creature named Tuakaran. The text is taken from Toran Pantan, a book of myths collected by Father Cicerio 
De Armaleda and published in 1989. The photographs are taken from 1917 edition of German ethnologist Theodor Koch Grunberg's book Von Roraima Zun Oranako, which unbelievably has never been translated into English. <laughs> oh, man. And they go on a long time ago, way. The son was an Indian who spent his time clearing and burning the mountain to make Kanuko to plant Okomo. The son ate only Okomo. His face shone brightly. One day after work, he was drinking water and bathed himself in a stream. As he got closer, he noticed a ripple across the pool of water as if somebody had submerged themselves. And he thought to himself, what could that be? The next day, he returned to the pool more quietly this time and saw a small woman with very long hair that reached down to her feet. She was bathing herself and playing and beating the water with her hair. When she noticed the sun, she came and she went down into the depths of the pool, but the sun managed to grab hold of her. Not me, not me, shout out the creature who was called Tuankaran. And she added, I will send you a woman to be your companion and wife. So we got some of this before, and then she kept sending different women over and all this stuff like that. But definitely read it, man. It's, it's entertaining at the least. <laughs> some women kept melting away. You know, he thought it was a joke. Let's get to the end of it right here. Let's get, you know, definitely read the whole thing, though. And sure enough, the next day the woman came very early. So this is the last woman that was created for Tuan Kara. All right. She cooked food. She roasted the akumu so she could do everything right. Everybody else was melting and, and dissipating, vaporizing for no reason. Um... So she grated the roots, and made cassava bread. That day she stayed the night and slept with the sun. And since then they have always been together. And they have several children. And these were the Makunaima. These were the Makunaima. Remember Makunaima they were saying up here. You know, it has to do with the creator, culture, hero, high God. But we also know he's slaying these monsters. So... And he's only recently been translated as God of Great Spirit in more recent texts. So is this, you know, a straight up hijack? Is he a hijack that the Creator used for certain purposes? Yeah, it's worth digging on. But now instead of one person, it says they had several children and these were Makunaim. Some Indians say the name of the mother was Aro Madapuin, and the names of the children were Mary, Mary, Rarek, Chiwadapuin, er, Era, Wadapuin, and the second daughter Aru Kadaru, uh, who was often called Chike. Aye, aye, aye. And we're just talking about the tree of life. When you talk with Rayma, the tree of life. Let's get into the devil tree of El Dorado. You got the link, pull it on up, man. Again, we're just talking about people like the Hebrews. notes on this stuff because I don't want to forget nothing and this is not a bad place to start man let's back it up a couple pages and start right here on around page 155 because we're going to get back into that trinema we've got some great comments man love to drop nation I appreciate your comments I read all your comments and I address some of them, you know, live, man, live on the radio, man, so make sure you tune in, man, especially for our live shows on Wednesday and Thursday. We do pre-recordings now for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We're reading three books cover to cover. Uh, Monday, we're reading the um, American Holocaust by uh, uh, David Stannard. Tuesday, we're reading the Black Jacobins, the Tucson Lee Overture. 
uh, Revolution by C.L.R. James. And Wednesday we're reading Africans and Native Americans, Red Black Peoples by, uh, by Forbes, man. Jack D. Forbes, so you can look it up, man. So, those are three books cover to cover, man. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Thursday, we have our Turf Thurs live show that we feature, man. Great independent artists, man. Producers, uh, you know what I'm saying? Singers, rappers, man. Everybody, we tune them to 432. We just allow them to be, you know, just give them a good bridge into the frequency. We understand that our, our tribe, man, um, you know, music. And our tribe go hand in hand. So, as our tribe continues to express themselves musically, we want them to have a place, a place that they can uh, grow. You know what I mean, musically and within themselves. So we create a bridge called Turf Thirds from our turf to your turf, from Inglewood to you. We broadcast live from Inglewood, Cali, man, and, and uh, you know the people are feeling it, man. And Friday we got our Shabbat show, our Shabbat show. We shut it down. Hakan Hire, man, hit you with another log, <laughs> and we fall back and keep flowing. So tune in live Thursday and Friday, and yeah, we do our best to get to some of these comments that you're dropping. I appreciate it. And uh, some of y'all been talking about this Trinema, so we're definitely going to dig on Trinema. Let's go. jump in it. to my utter astonishment he replied that he had reason to believe that there was truth in what I had been told he had doubtless heard the same thing and he is so quick to probe to the very root of whatever excites his interest and a man so difficult to deceive that on receiving his solemn assurance I asked for it that he was not jesting. I felt bound to regard the matter, the matter attentively. I therefore set to work to get at all the facts as well as I could and to see and examine the wonderful plant for myself. We're going to talk about these beautiful plants. You got the tree of life, you got the plant of life. Let's go. In this way, I have arrived at the following data. The plant, which is called Carina, so we have Trinema and another plant called Carina, could be the same, let's go. In the language of the country, is of a curious, delicate, clear blue tint, almost transparent in appearance. Remember, they got their own ecosystem at this ether, so we're reading about these magical plants and you tell me what it has to do with the Voynich manuscript that they can't decipher. A manuscript full of beautiful plants and they don't know how to decipher this encrypted Hebrew, they call it. Encrypted Hebrew. And now they're going to find these priests that resemble the way of the Hebrews. Let's go. Hey man, I'm not making this shit up. I can't make this shit up. Let's get it. We're just talking about the Garden of Eden, Orinoco. Talking about the mighty tree, the tree of life, the plants of life. So this particular plant called Carina, delicate, clear, blue tint, almost transparent in appearance, and in texture, smooth and glassy looking as to the leaves. It grows to a height of two or three feet and is succulent in character, exuding freely when squeezed a juice. <laughs> All right, got some juice, which has a very strong, bitter taste. It is prepared in several ways, many having, it is believed, secret recipes. Man, are we talking about the Voynich Manuscript? Remember, MIT's doing everything they can to decipher this. Harvard, Oxford, no one can decipher this Voynich manuscript, so we will be getting back to it. Because we see how it all connects. 
to Preston John, to Saliman. You see how it all is coming together, right? Secret recipes which have been handed down from father to son, from generation to generation. But they all relate more or less to a tea or infusion of the leaves with or without the admixture of other herbs or drugs. To have the full effect, it must be taken regularly, almost from infancy. So they start giving it to their babies as an infant. Indeed, it is so powerful that those not accustomed to it must take but very weak doses at first for a long time. Till the system learns to assimilate it, otherwise it may even act as a poison. Taken, however, regularly from childhood, it produces and maintains perfect health so again we've been talking about the scripts we've been in Ezekiel 30 31 Job 14 talking about these trees of course Genesis has a lot of tree drop about you know most high cutting down these trees now we're seeing these trees that are literally cut down cut off and we're reading about this perfect health again. Pastor John, in his letters, talk about, you know, living, you know, past 500 years and, you know, getting baptized in a fountain of youth. Literally, your age turns back to 32. So they, they know all about the secrets, right? The secret recipes for perfect health. Defying all those usual fevers and diseases that afflict humanity and other parts of the world and carrying the body unimpaired in all its functions, accidents of course accepted, into extreme age. So in the script we read about all these, you know, Noah's 900 years old, all this stuff like that, right? Without loss of vitality or strength. They, they're living, man, thousands of years. Some of them said they're thousands of years old without the loss of vitality or strength. All because of what this this Carina plant curious delicate clear blue tint transparent in appearance glassy looking as as to the leaves let's go quote people do not however live forever there is one disease and only one that the Carina cannot cure so we've got some of this last time it's called the Foloa another name for it signifying the don't care sickness, those attack with it gradually sink and die painlessly and easily. So the one thing that it can't cure is what they're calling this folia, meaning that it's this type of vibration that, you know, you, you just kind of start to sink down. You don't really care and you die painlessly. So it's still a painless death. Does this sound like eating to you? Even after you live for thousands of years. The worst case scenario is, is that you fall into this folia. <laughs> Those attack with it sink and die painlessly and easily. You still got a painless, easy death after a thousand years. This disease, no doubt, must come to all sooner or later. So, you know, it's just your time. <laughs> but it's painless. But it generally believed that the priest and they alone are aware of some way or so of preparing the Karina that they can either cure even the Faloa. So the priest, the priest, we're going to talk about these priests. We're going to talk about these Hebrew priests. We're going to talk about these Solomons and Preston Johns that even know how to overcome the Faloa or keep it at bay for very much longer periods than other people succeed in doing. It is certainly a remarkable fact that throughout the land, disease in the sense in which we understand it is unknown. So we're just used to it, we accept it, but it's unknown to them. Man. Consequently, physical pain is almost absent. 
save in case of physical injury. Nor is it necessary to be continually taking the preparation of the carina once the system becomes inoculated with it, as it were, it is sufficient afterward to repeat the doses at long intervals. So you're not to take it every day no more. And a traveler, as I gather, might take sufficient of the dry plant with him on his travels to keep him in perfect health for many years. So if you just get a few of this stuff, you're going to be good for a minute. <laughs> and when at last the phalloa attacks his victim, it causes neither pain nor suffering of any kind, only melancholy, melancholy and a distaste for life in general. While its approach is so gradual as often to be unnoticed, and there is little doubt that the absence of ordinary disease exerts a corresponding effect upon the physical development, and this alone is sufficient to account for a fact that it is very noticeable here, the beauty of the inhabitants, both the women and men, are remarkable in this respect probably not in all the rest of the world put together could so many beautiful women and handsome men be found we're talking about the magic tree we're talking about Roray Ma and the inhabitants of this area are the most beautiful in the entire world the real inhabitants my Naga the real inhabitants of Warrena. And this applies to the old in measure as well as to the young generally. Whether it is also applies to the old, whether it also applies to the old among the priests, one cannot say, for they seem to keep entirely to themselves. As regards these priests, there are two sects two sections right in the country called dark or black and the white they're not talking about black and white people they're talking about perspectives we're talking about star wars the force the light force the dark side let's go the religion of the white priest or brotherhood resembles in many respects that of the hebrews Save that for God they use the term great spirit or good or almighty spirit. These have, however, now no influence in the country and have been exiled to Merlanda. So the black priest must have overtaken the quote white priest. That's why there's quotes because they're not talking about black and white people. We're talking energy, frequency, and vibration. And this energy of these Hebrew people has been cut down. They've been exiled. The Hebrews have been exiled to what they're calling Merlanda, where they confine themselves to a small do domain, have few followers, and very little communication with the general inhabitants. Then it goes on into the Dark Brotherhood, man. Let's go to page 210. All this is in the drop library. Love to talk battle for dropping it. You got the links below. Now this chapter number 20 is called A Message of Apollon. The furniture in use in the city of Manoa in material and style was unlike that found in Japan. That in the palace was of exquisite design and finish, much of it inlaid with gold and silver. We're talking about the temples, we're talking about the priests, we're talking about Roraima, and what they're actually finding in Roraima. This is from Devil Tree of Adorado. This is a sketch of these three explorers. And what do they see? They see a city of go -o 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 within the caverns of the mountains inside 
the mountain. Look at these palaces. And this is what they are seeing. This is what they are seeing. Let's go. That in the palace was of exquisite design and finished much of it in labor gold and silver. It was such a cabinet that Monella now unlocked. He took from it a parchment roll. This, he said, is the document I gave the king the first day he received us. Now, of course, it belongs to him, but I have, but I have borrowed it temporarily to show you. It was written by Apollano, the last descendant of those white priests. So we're talking about a Hebrew, right? The ways of the Hebrew. And this Apollano, this message of Apollano, if we surf the wave with them, is a message from a Hebrew priest. Let's go. Who fled this country ages ago with the King Melinda. In some of the old parchments in my possession, it is described how those who thus went away found the empire going everywhere to pieces and falling a prey to barbaric hordes of black or red or cruel white races. Oh yeah, Confederacy, Psalms 83. And how they eventually took refuge in a secluded valley high up amongst the peaks of the Andes of which I have already spoken to you and dwelt there through many centuries we're talking about Machu Picchu what we're talking about they have brought with them and succeeded in cultivating the plant of life the plant of life or the Karina But notwithstanding and albeit it made them all long live and the fatal disease the Faloa claimed them one after the other till Apollano and I alone were left. Then the Faloa laid its withering hand upon Apollo. Apollano also. He lost his last child and that affected him very deeply for before he died he wrote it, this strange letter which tells all about myself that I know with certainty yet hence as you will see at still more to be learned in the future so let's get the drop let's get the hints to be learned in the future I will read it to you to Sanayama the chief white priest of Manoa or if dead his descendant or successor or to the reigning king of Manoa, greetings. I, Apollona, Lano, the last of the descendants of the white priests, or the Hebrews, who fled with the great king, Melinda. Do commend to your care the bearer of this letter, he whom you will know by the name Monella. Now let's pay attention to this Manella. Let's go. He is, after myself, the sole survivor of our race outside the land of Manoa. So Manella would also be a Hebrew descendant, surfing his way. Treat him with all courtesy, respect, and confidence, for he is of royal descent. Oh, man. Well, they already mentioned the Hebrews and their... Let's get it again. We're going to 11. The religion of the white priest or brotherhood resembles in many respects that of the Hebrews. Right? So that's why the Hebrews play because they brought up the Hebrews and the connection of the the place of whiteness, the Aslan, the Aslan, the cedar, the whiteness, the purity. We're not talking about W I G H T. 
We're talking about W-H-I-T-E for the purity. Let's go. Back to 211. So he's saying that Monella is the sole survival of our race. So are we still talking Hebrews? Treat him with all courtesy and respect, for he is of royal descendants. Are we talking Hebrews? And the unsullied blood of thine ancient line of kings flows in his veins. Are we talking Hebrew king? Mark well his counsels, give heed to his warnings, and observe his rulings. So he is a priest king, Monella, just like Apollano. Observe his rulings, for he comes to restore the true religion of the great spirit. And to bring peace and happiness to our land. Long years ago he did receive a grievous injury to the head in combat with the savage foe. This cast a shadow upon his memory of the past so that he knoweth not of what went before. Ain't that just like you my naga? You have no idea what happened in your past. You don't have your memories back yet. And his former life is blank, right, my naga? Save for some vague passing glimpses that at rare times come back to him in the guise of dreams and visions, right, my naga? We could have told him much of all that went before, but we have re re refrained first for that he might not have rightly comprehended what we had to tell, and next in mercy for he has suffered much. It was deemed best that the recollections of his suffering should sleep until the time for his awakening should arrive, when the work for which the Great Spirit had appointed him shall lie before him and shall form his sorrow's antidote and comfort. Quote, the memory that hath untimely been suspended, for we know that it may not be destroyed. So your memories are not destroyed, my naga. They've been temporarily drawn offline, right? Perchance may be restored to its full power by such an accident as wrecked it, but failing that, there is but one sure treatment, namely to drink of the infusion of the herb called Tranima. And this is why a lot of you in Drop Nation said, man, what it do with that Tranema, man? I need to go holler at, go holler at a guala on that Tranema, man. Now this Tranema grows in Merlander. Remember where it says most of the Hebrews or the white priests have been exiled to Merlander? Now Merlander is another one of these same tepuis, right? One of these same tabletop mountains. So there's multiple tabletop mountains or tree stumps, and Merlander is one of them, along with Rarema. All connected, right? And nowhere else. So this Trinema only grows in Merlanda and nowhere else. You try to Google Trinema, all you're gonna get is this book right here. You know what I'm saying? All you're gonna get is this book right here. Whether you're talking about Kanima or Trinema, you're talking about the plants of life. Let the stranger Monella that bringeth this to thee drink of Trinema in accordance with the rules. I have laid down for him upon another scroll. Let him for some weeks take of it sparingly, e even as I have written, then more frequently, and lo, all his past life, now hidden, shall be revealed to him. So something about taking this Trinema will restore our memory and that's why you're not going to find a lot of drop or dang near any drop 
on this Trinema online or what. But we know that it has something to do with this Merlanda. We know it has something to do with this place where it grows in Merlanda and nowhere else. We know it grows in Merlanda and nowhere else. Let the stranger Monella that bringeth this to thee drink of Trenema in accordance with the rules I have laid down. So there's a special way to do it. It's not like, you know, you just do it and start drinking. There's rules to this. In accordance with the rules I have laid down for him upon another scroll. All right, so there's another scroll that has the rules, all right, written by this, written by this, uh, Apollano, this Apollano who's breaking down the rules. I mean, so there's scrolls <laughs> that are breaking down the rules of how to take this Trinema drug. There's rules to this. So he wrote him down on another scroll. So let him for some weeks take of it sparingly, even as I have written, then more frequently and lo, all his past life now hidden shall be revealed to him. The sun shall light up. What sun? Oh, you have an inner sun, right? We're talking about your pine cone, your pineal. Bang! Your sun, your inner sun shall light up the recesses of his memory. And he shall know himself and what lies before him. All by drinking. To drink of the infusion of the herb called Trenema that grows in Merlanda and nowhere else. And my dying eyes, though unable yet to pierce the future, still can see that this coming against you shall be in itself a sign of the truth of these my words. When he shall appear to you, I know not, only that it will be at the time the great spirit has appointed. Not an hour sooner, nor an hour behind that time. So we're talking about a prophecy of a priest king returning. They're calling Monella, right? Not an hour sooner or an hour behind. Hey, not one minute. It's going to be right on time. And herein you shall read a message from the Almighty Spirit. And you shall know that Manila's coming at that special time was marked out by the hand of destiny. And you shall find upon his body marks whose meaning will be known unto Sanaima or to him on whom hath fallen his mantle. With my greeting I bid you now farewell, you unto whom this scroll shall be delivered, my first and last message to the land of my forefathers and to those that now rule there. Through many centuries we, a faithful few, have kept your memory and our love for you green in our hearts. And I and those who have been with me had hoped as the appointed time drew near that the great spirit would have deigned to grant us to see our ancient city and our native land. Who does this sound like, my naga? Don't you want to see your ancient city? Don't you want to see your native land? But it was not to be all have gone save me and him who brings you this but in him I send the blessing that we have preserved 
and nursed for you through long years of persecution and despair. If you would return our love and care for you, I pray you show them unto him we sin. I know that he is worthy of them, and further, that in his own breast he bears for you the sum of all the love we in our own persons would have shown had we been spared to greet you. I and those who have preceded me to the land of the Great Spirit. Awa, farewell, Apollano. When Monella had finished reading the strange letter, he leaned his chin upon his hand and fell into a reverie. Leonard and Templemore, meaning, meanwhile, looked on in silence. Presently, Monella roused himself and with a deep drawn sigh passed his hand across his forehead with a look of pain. His action was as though he had half caught some flittering thought or memory that had after all eluded him and that the effort to retain it had cost him mental pain. After a short interval he said with one of his rare smiles and in the musical voice that captivated everyone so full were they of Kind, kindliness, quote, Now you know as much about me as I know myself. I did not show you this before because I had been charged to hand it only to those to whom it was addressed. And this is the first opportunity I have since had for the king sent to Sanaima, who returned it only a day or two ago. But since you must now consider seriously the question of your going or remaining, it is right that you should know all I can tell you of myself. It is very little, yet sufficient to explain my present feelings. You can understand now that you have read the letter that I am now, with all my heart and soul, one with these people. I look at everything from their point of view. I consider only their interests, their welfare, their safety, their advantage. He's choosing up. He's remembering who he is, this Manella. If you shall elect to remain with us to become one of us, you shall find me ever a staunch friend who will do all he can to make you feel at home amongst us and will place you in positions of great honor. If, on the other hand, you prefer to leave us, you shall not go without such marks of the king's favor as are beyond perhaps your dreams. These are the alternatives that lie before you. Take time to ponder them. There is, as I have told you, no need for an immediate decision. When after leaving Manila, the two were once more alone together, Leonard bust out with the thought that filled his mind. Quote, I scarcely know how to express my feelings. I am full of sadness and yet of joy. I know not which predominates. I know what it will be, said Jack gloomily, you will stay, and I shall have to return alone. What excuse I shall give to people for leaving you here, dead to them and to the world forever. So this is like that uh, turning point. They, they went too far. They went too far. We're in like chapter 20. They went too far by this point. So they had an option to stay or go. You can stay here. And get some of these uh, cities of gold or go back. He said, what excuse should I have to the people for leaving you here, dead to them and to the world forever, or whether I shall ever be forgiven for appearing to have deserted you? God only knows. I wish you would think a little upon this. For the rest, I congratulate you with all my heart to be the future king of so ancient and remarkable a nation is a piece of luck that does not fall to everybody by Hove that's they that's they got right. he exclaimed with increasing earnestness upon my word I don't wonder at your going in for it indeed if that is well if I had not already set my mind upon something else I would chuck up the, the world in general and throw in my lot with you and be your your prime minister or state engineer or some other high functionary functionary and he laughed good-naturedly 
at the ideas the suggestion caught up in his mind. Don't let us meet trouble halfway, said Leonard hopefully. The time of parting is not yet. Who knows what may turn up. Manella may make us some concession that will meet the case. And now look here. I have been thinking of a plan for sending a message home, Jack stared. How on earth, he asked. So they're talking about how to send a message back home because they're in another world. Remember, this is a lost world. It won't be much of a message, and perhaps it will never reach home, but we can try. Let us find a place where we can get a view in the direction of Monella's Lodge and watch at night for campfires out on the far savannah. We must find a spot screened from observation on this side. Then we will bring some powder up from our stores and flash some signals as Manella had arranged. But what good would that, would that do? Even it, even it, they are seen. It will only be by Indians who will not understand them. Never mind. If any Indians see them, they are sure to spread the news about. And probably the first place to hear of it will be Dar Daranato, the Indian village where my old nurse Karina lives. Matava may have told her about the signals or even other Indians. At any rate, she would be pr pretty sure to hear of them and let Matava know when he returns or perhaps even send a message down by some one going to the coast to say that the signals have been seen that showed we were alive on the summit of Roraima. Jack reflected, yes. He presently said slowly, yes, there is something in the idea. We will try it. It can do no harm, but to be of any good, we shall have a signal frequently once or twice would not be of much use. Precisely before long, Matava will be back from the coast and we will hear them and will come out on the savannah at night to see them for himself. And he would watch night after night with the Indians' patience till he saw them. Yes, I suppose Manella won't object. We ought not to do it without his, con without his consent. But for that awful force, we might even go farther. We might make an expedition for a week or two and get to Manella's lodge and leave a letter there, or even to Daranato and leave letters to be taken to the coast by the first Indians going that way. No, we can't manage that, nor would Manella like us to be away so long. You never know what trouble might turn up here with these priests and their vile crew. And that reminds me of that letter Manella read today. What do you think of it? An extraordinary letter. Really, I feel almost inclined to go back to my former idea that Manella and his friends were all mad together, Leonard shared against. What? You speak of that again, he claimed, real ignition in his tone, after the way everything has come out, after all Manella's kindness. Jack stopped him with a smile and touch, and touch of his hand on his other arm. Put the brake on, old man, he said. I don't mean anything disrespectful. But if Manella, who already seems to have been about the world and to have seen as much as three ordinary men on three score years and ten, if the point to which his memory reaches is only a portion, listen up, <laughs> we're just talking Hebrews, right? White priest, exile, tree of life, garden of Eden. Priest kings, we're talking Noah and the flood, the mighty tree stump falling, creating a flood, right? Let's go. But if Monella, who already seems to be, to have been about the world and to have seen as much as three ordinary men of three score years and ten, if the point to which his memory reaches is only a portion of his life, why you see, he must be Methuselah, or the wandering Jew himself, or some other mythical being. Body bag, Daniel. Body bag for the illusion. <laughs> what? I know. 
I know you didn't see that coming. We're talking Noah. We're talking Methuselah. You're talking a wandering Jew or wandering Hebrew. So this is confirmation that when we're talking white priests, being just like these Hebrews, we're talking the Hebrews themselves and priest kings and the priest kings of the Hebrews like Methuselah, like Noah. Remember this tree fell and created this flood. Oh boy, I know. If the point to which his memory reaches is only a portion of his life, why you see he must be Methuselah or the wandering Jew, the wandering Jew himself or some other mythical being. Hmm. Already he has puzzled me times enough with his extraordinary tales. At the same time, you cannot doubt his absolute sincerity so that if his complete memory is to go back farther still, why, heaven help us, we shall, we shan't know whether we are our heads, whether we are on our heads or our heels. <laughs> so they don't know what's going on. But after a short silence, Leonard spoke. But if they had this plant of life, right? Remember the trinema that gives him his memory back? If they had this plan of life with them, those he was with would, would that not in part account for? It might, but it is making large demands on one's credulity. But what I really mean is this. I am inclined at times to think Manella a bit mad. He has a religious mania. He has persuaded himself and evidently from that letter he has encouraged, been encouraged by others to believe it. That he has a re religious mission to these people. We're talking priest king, right? Well, no harm in that, you say. No. And that he is honorable, upright, sincere. I feel very certain. Still, he may be self-deceived. He seems to me... He seems to me to be one of those fervently religious mystics, mystics who can persuade themselves into almost anything. Yet he he is no fanatic. See how mild and gentle he can be, how slow to anger, how just in his discrimination between right and wrong. I admit all that. Still, I repeat, he might easily deceive himself. That afternoon, Leonard sought about Ulama and asked to be allowed to row her on the lake and to this she smiled a, a glad assent when he had rowed the boat out a long distance from the shore he laid down the oars and let her drift a gentle breeze was blowing and this served to temper the ardor of the waning the waning sun yeah we're gonna pick it up from there man just right quick let's get to this uh 69 you know just different points you know that we have been surfing in this text and then we'll uh, you know get a couple pages out of the lost world the Conan Doyle book that we keep hearing about we're just talking golden cities right cities of gold oh, 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 oh. this is in chapter 7 so we're talking Manila so we got all that you know a few chapters ahead so we know where we at we're talking Methuselah we're talking Hebrew priest kings, Manella with the lantern in his hand, led two companions through an arched opening into a second cavern, which seemed to be larger and loftier than the first. So they're in the caverns, in the canyons, within the mountain, and what do they see? What do they see? Let's go. A second cavern, which seemed larger, which seemed to be larger. Oh, there we go. What do they see? Cities of go. Oh, 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 oh. So the second cavern seemed to be larger and loftier than the first, and this in turn opened into a third. Right. So they're seeing these caverns open up, these caves. At one end of which they could see the daylight entered. Monella stopped here. 
and lifting the light high in one hand pointed with the other to the side openings in the rock. They are side galleries, so to speak, but do not appear to be of any great extent. I have been to the end of two or three. They all seem to be perfectly empty, too. Not so much as a trace of anything that I see, save loose pieces of stone here and there that had no doubt fallen from the roof. Now we will go to the entrance on this side. He turned and walked on towards this place where they could see the glimmering of daylight. Quite suddenly they turned a corner and saw before them a high archway leading out into the open air and before the two young men had had time to express surprise they had stepped out of the gloomy cavern into a valley where they stood and stared in helpless astonishment what did they see in this valley in Mount Rorema a scene that was as lovely and enchanting as it was utterly unexpected they saw before them the bottom of a valley or canyon or about half a mile in length and nearly a quarter of a mile in width its floor if one may use the expression considering chiefly of fine sand of a warm tawny hue its sides of rocks of white and pinkish white fine grain sandstone with here and there veins two or three feet wide listen up of some metallic looking material that glisten in the sunlight like masses of gold and silver cities of go oh, 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 oh. glisten in the sunlight like masses of gold and silver and other places were veins of jasper porphyry or some analogous rock that sparkled and flashed as though embedded with diamonds. Other parts again were dark colored like black marble, throwing up in strong relief the ferns and flowers that grew in front of them. At the further end of the valley, a waterfall tumbled and, fo and foamed in the rains of, rays of the sun which being now almost overhead threw its beams along the whole length of the canyon, the stream that flowed below the fall widened out into clear pools here and there fringed by stretches of velvety sward of a vivid green. The waters of this stream was a wonderful turquoise blue tint different from anything Templemore thought that he had ever seen before and he and Elwood gazed with admiration at its inviting, pellucid pools. But most extraordinary of all were the flowers that nearly everywhere were to be seen, in shape and brilliancy of coloring, and in many other respects, they differed entirely from every, from even the rare and wonderful, wonderful orchids and other blossoms they had come across in the vicinity of Warrena. So this particular pocket, this valley, was a place of its own, even within the vicinity of Arama, they had never seen nothing like this. Of trees, there were not many, though a few were dotted around here and there by the side of the river, and in places graceful palms grew out of the rock slopes at the sides and leaned over, somewhat after the fashion of gigantic ferns. Though the valley was so shut in, and the heat in the sun very great, yet the amount of green vegetation on all sides, the blue water and the light colored, cool looking rocks made up a scene that was gratefully refreshed after the gloom of the four scenes to which the explorers had been so accustomed. Moreover, by stepping back into the cool air of the cavern, they could look out upon it all without experiencing the drawback of the intense heat. So they're seeing literally cities of gold. Monella the while had been standing gazing on the scene like one in a dream. 
More than once he passed his hand over his eyes in a confused way as though to make sure he was awake. When thus addressed, however, he seemed to rouse himself and without noticing the bantering question that had been addressed to him and extended, extending one hand slowly towards the valley that lay before him, said, I praise heaven that I have been led after many days to the land that I have seen in my vision. So this is Methuselah, or some Hebrew prophet, who hasn't got all his memories back yet, but after he gets that trinema, he'll be straight. After you get that trinema, you'll be straight. He said, I praise heaven that I have been led after many days to the land I have seen in my visions. Now do I begin to understand why they were sent and you too, my son, he added, you have had. It's another sketch of them being within this mountain. A scene that was gratefully refreshing. It's at the waterfall. Your visions and dreams, tell me, does this not remind you of them? And think of nothing but how best you can serve and protect your friends, said Manella, looking at them with a kindly smile. We are not all like my friend. It is not given to all to dream dreams any more than it is given to all to have true manly courage combined with almost womanly affection for those that they call friends. We three have little to boast of as between one another, I fancy, would it would it were so more often where three friends are found grouped together and associated in any undertaking but now to consider what is next to be done it seems to me we could not have a better place for our headquarters and our future explorations than this cavern so they found this cavern near this cities of gold now let's get to this uh, lost world Rayma, the mighty tree. And we'll go to uh, page 160, man, and get ready for our dismount, man. It's been a beautiful flow in part three of Rayma. Feels good not to leave it behind. To know that our drop is here, man. Our drop is now, man. Let's go. So right here, we on uh, what? 66. Let's go. Creeping to his side. This is the Conan Doyle book, page 166. Creeping to his side, we looked over the rocks. The place into which we gazed was a pit and mint and may in the early days have been one of the smaller volcanic blowholes in a plateau. It was bowl shaped at the bottom some hundreds of yards, some hundreds of yards from where, oh yeah, oh yeah, hold up man. Alright, so we got... It was bowl shaped at the bottom some hundreds of yards from where we lay were pools of green scum, stagnant water, fringed with bulrushes. It was a weird place in itself, but its occupants made it seem like a scene from the seven circles of Dante. Seven cities, right? The place was a rookery of pterodactyls. So although some articles say, oh, we never found any dinosaurs there, but yet, you have these particular expeditions that are being documented again in the 1500s, 1800s, 1900s. And this one, The Lost World by Conan Doyle, 
It's literally saying that they found a rookery or a dragon's lair, right? Pterodactyls. There were hundreds of them congregated within view. All the bottom area around the water edge was alive with their young ones and with hideous mothers brooding upon their leathery, yellowish eggs. Dragons and dragon eggs. From the crawling, flapping mass of obscene reptilian life came the shocking clamor which filled the air and the mephitic, horrible, musty order which turned it sick. But above, perched upon its own stone, tall, gray, withered, more like dead and dried specimens than actual living creatures, sat the horrible males, absolutely motionless save for the rolling of their red eyes or an occasional snap of their rat trap beaks as a dragonfly went past them. Their huge members ring wings were close were closed by folding their forearms so that they sat like gigantic old women wrapped in hideous web colored shawls. So they keep saying hideous because they're scared as a mug. And with their ferocious heads protruding above them, large and small, not less than a thousand of these filthy creatures lay in the hollow before us. So they saw over a thousand dragons. One, our professors would gladly have stayed there all day, so entranced were they by this opportunity of studying the life of the prehistoric age. They pointed out that the fish and dead birds laying among the rock as proof, as proving the nature of the food of the creatures, and I heard them congratulating each other on having cleared up the point why the bones of this flying dragon are found in such great numbers in certain well-defined areas as in the Cambridge Green Sand, since it was now seen that like pigeons they lived in gregarious fashion. And we're just talking about the lost world, right? The lost world where they're seeing the thousands, what they say, large and small, not less than a thousand of what? <laughs> they finally got it. Flying dragons. Oh, we're just talking with Rayma. We're just getting the drop about with Rayma, man. Just getting all the drop, man. You know what I mean? And you can keep digging. This series is always going to continue because just like these particular, you know what I'm saying, expeditions. Oh, man, let me load this up again. Just like these expeditions that they got here, man, you know, they're using repeatable and observable signs to get to the bottom of what they're finding here. And, uh, you know, no one's ever done no expeditions, no public ones that they've been telling you about, right? But in this, you're saying that they're seeing these cities, they're seeing gold, silver inlaid, you know, whole cities, regions. They got priests. They have priests that they're calling Methuselah. And we'll get this uh, beautiful picturesque flow for the dismount here, man. Much a high, shallow, drop nation. You know, it's about our awareness. It's about our vision. Our awareness is changing things. Our awareness. Our awareness is changing the entire game. You know, they might have had the Rex 84 plan, but did they have the Trinema plan? Did they have the Rorema plan? Do they have the Flying Dragon plan? So when you read that in the 1800s, they're already talking about your Flying Dragons. Now they have their artificial Flying Dragons, but it all started with what is already here and what they already see. We'll keep it going for part four of Mount Rorema. 
Man, look out for some Kamahamaha drop. <laughs> Kamaya, Kamaya. Look out for this Preston John series to take off, man. And keep surfing the wave in the ether. What are you searching for? And what will you find? In the mighty tree of Mount Rorema. The tree of life. The garden of Eden. The cities of gold. You just call it home. The Baruch. The blessing. Allah. Peace and power to the tribe. Shabbat. Time.